Hello, Notcast 144. It's not a podcast, so it's called Notcast. Today, I'm going to be talking about um, a band I love and an album I love. Depeche Mode's sixth album, Music for the Masses, released in 1987. And 1987 was a very, very expensive year for me. Um, there is the view that uh, your formative experiences as a teenager form who you are as an adult. Uh, my formative experiences as a teenager were set staying indoors, getting records out of the Birmingham Library, taking them onto cassette, and then listening to them for the rest of my life. Um, it was a very expensive summer, in the same way people talk about the golden summer of 1982, uh, from, from a film perspective, because that summer saw the release of The Thing, Blade Runner, Poltergeist, E.T., Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and then other lesser films with titles like Beats, Beastmaster. Uh, and... The summer of 1987 was a really expensive summer because it opened my mind in many, many ways. I started off loving music by loving soundtracks. and lo I wanted to live in movies and listening to the soundtracks at home was a way of being able to you know, preserve or at least echo the experience that I had sitting in a darkened room watching lights and sounds. Uh, one could argue that things don't change very much because in the days when there were concerts and we've, we're starting to go back to concerts, I would go to lots of them and again I'd stand in a small dark room uh, with lights and sound at very loud volumes trying to pretend that the rest of the world didn't exist, much like I did when I was 13 years old and watching movies. Um, the summer of 1987 saw a lot of albums released. Uh, that therefore cost me a lot of money. Um, in no particular order, although I'm going to try and do it alphabetically, The Cure released Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Depeche Mode released Music for the Masses, New Order released Substance, The Pet Shop Boys released Actually, uh, U2 released The Joshua Tree, and um, The Smiths released Strange Ways, Here We Come, and Def Leppard released Hysteria. And Hysteria, by the way, by Def Leppard, is one of the finest albums of all time. But it wasn't the best album of 1987, and neither was Music for the Masses. The best album of 1987 is Prince's Sign of the Times, um, and I'm prepared to die on that hill, and I think some of you watching this will join me on that hill. So we're going to start talking about Depeche Mode in 1987 with the first single that's released eight months after the end of the 1986 Black Celebration Tour, uh, saw the release of the 1987 single Strange Love. Strange Love is a classic Depeche Mode single, a single which sadly the band barely play live. They haven't played it live since 2009 and uh, they've only played it live on half a tour between 1990 and today. Uh, I'd just like to kind of quickly report the iconography of this cover uh, and, and all the related covers from this period. The, the visuals that the band are using at this point is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it ties in with the concept of the album being called Music for the Masses. By the way, there is a deletion hole here uh, because um, the uh, cutouts, I think I mentioned in a previous episode, is that they used to cut through part of the sleeves so you couldn't resell them at full price, which is why I bought this, because I could afford this as opposed to the £3.49 for the proper 12-inch single. Of Strange Love. This is a German edition on Intercourt. So we're going to talk about Strange Love and the first single that was released from the album. That it came in a number of formats. Here's a couple of 12 inches for you. Uh, for those of you who have a visual bent, there is also a CD single. I have a card single somewhere, but I can't couldn't find it when I was looking. And this, the seven inch single. This seven inch single. Uh, is is absolutely fantastic, and um, I'm a huge fan of things like typography, fonts, and getting it right. Now, I mean, just look at that; it looks lovely, doesn't it? Uh, let's not look at the B size. That doesn't look quite so lovely. There's two stickers on there, and the second sticker. Oh my giddy out! Yes, uh, it ends just as the very song begins. So we've got to, so I've got a weird freak of nature version of Strange Love. Strange Love is a, a classic Depeche Mode single, although the band themselves aren't huge fans of it. Um, it was released on the 28th of April 1987 it was the first Depeche Mode single to audibly feature I think guitars um, and there was a, there's a number of versions of this song it's got quite a convoluted history in Depeche Mode uh, stories so to say for example the 7 inch version of the song uh, is basically a completely different recording apart from the vocals to the LP mix and the 7 inch version was one which I think the band thought was quite cluttered. Uh, it's a very busy mix. Uh, it's, it's, you listen to it and you go, there's more song in there 
than a seven inch single would really tell you. So there's there's two bass lines in there. There's a high and a low bass line, or there's a fast and a slow bass line. Um, Martin's demo of the track, by the way, which uh, nobody has heard, featured the fast bass line, which we hear on, on the single version. Alan also came up with the idea of, of playing the, the bass line on the demo at half speed. So there's two bass lines that run throughout Strange Love. There's a fast one and there's a slow one, and they kind of sync up and echo each other in a call and response basis. Um, the, there's also guitars on here, there's a whole bunch of backing vocals which have been simplified for the LP mix and each one of the remixes has slightly different sets of backing vocals by the way. So there's um, the blind mix has extra backing vocals on it, the hijack mix has extra backing vocals on it that you don't get on any other mix of it and then there's this version as well which features the call and response between Martin and Dave during the, um, the, the pain section of the song and the um the 12 inch version uh this is called the maxi mix by the way has an extended edit um so there's there's lots and lots going on and this is a standard black vinyl here the original in the sleeve um there was a i knew a guy that would smell these records uh, and he'd be like sniff that it smells better when it comes out of germany i'm just like you're weird and I'm in a house with you and I'm just going to tolerate you and then I'm going to go, mate. I don't need to feel the label on the German Sisters of Mercy 12 inch. Um, I don't care about the label. Which is good because this isn't a Mute Records label, this is an Intercore label uh, from Germany which is a little bit more generic um, from 1987. So there's a maxi mix on the 12 inch which is an extended version of the uh, single which which has a different edit ending and it really kind of explores I think the instrumental potential of the rest of the song this is in the days when 12 inch mixes were genuinely 12 inch mixes uh, and when you had tracks that were uh, kind of like almost extended variations so every six every seven inch edit was actually a really truncated version of a song the 12 inch was where it's at which is why I've got a long-standing love of 12 inch remixes um, and the B-side on Strange Love, wherever I've put the 7-inch, uh, was a song called Pimp, uh, which is a kind of Philip Glass-inspired, largely um, instrumental song with uh, a call and response section of the band chanting to each other about hold and give and hold and give. There's a video by Anton Corbin in which the band pound upon the walls of an empty shed until it collapses. Of course, trying to make sense of an Anton Corbin video is like trying to make sense of a David Lynch film. You can't do it, you just have to feel your way through an Anton Corbin video and eventually some kind of meaning suggests itself to you. It normally involves Dutch women holding eggs for some reason. Um, but uh, no, the pimp, the B-side, um, it's a great B-side, perhaps not a great album track, but a great B-side. And there's a, a remix of Pimp on the 12-inch, which is called if, For Pimp. Um, I don't fully understand why it has a different intro, and that's pretty much the only thing that's different about it. There's also, on this 12-inch, uh, a track called The Midi Mix of Strange Love. The Midi Mix of Strange Love uh, is uh, a playback of the track where half of the track didn't load. And so it's basically a very short, instrumental, ambient version of the song that was later aborted. Uh, the second 12-inch. Uh, this is a little bit more interesting for you, fans of Depeche. Firstly, it's got an absolutely gorgeous cover. I, I love the cover. I mean, looking at the cover of that, I'm not, that could be an LP cover. That could be the LP cover for the Depeche Mode album, to be honest. It's strong enough to do it. It's got the iconography that's in there. And if you flip over to the back... Um, I very rarely go, oh, look at the design of this sleeve, but I think a huge part of the appeal of Depeche Mode at this point, alongside New Order and alongside some other bands, was around the visual element of, of the group. Is that There's an idea that you know, you're not just holding a record here, you're holding a mass-produced work of art. You're holding something that looks like, it, it looks like it contains a degree of mystery to it. And it's like, well, if you buy the record, you get to find out what the secret is and I think some other bands uh, from the same period I, I'm going to specifically mention Erasure and OMD perhaps didn't have such a tight view upon upon their artwork now this didn't necessarily reflect itself into the label designs uh, they're not a very exciting label at all but you hold the sleeve in your hands by the way by the time you see the label you've almost definitely bought the record uh, but you hold the sleeve in your hands and you go this is this record is a mystery and I need to buy it to understand it um, whereas Erasure and OMD, their, their covers didn't quite have that air of mystery to it. They had a different personality. They were perhaps a little bit more obvious. 
new order and Depeche Mode, it did feel like you were holding some kind of sacred text when you held a record. It's a very, very strange feeling indeed. But you'll know it when you can see it. Pink Floyd albums have the same approach. Um, so the, the 12 inch of Strange Love, this is the limited edition remix 12 inch, uh, contained a number of remix. It contained the Blind Mix and the Pain Mix, as well as a 7 inch version of Pimp and a new track called Agent Orange. Agent Orange sounds very, very similar to some generic out of copyright music that is currently being used for um, TV adverts, by the way. It's kind of like somebody sat down, a composer, said, listen to Depeche Mode's Agent Orange and make something like that, but 3% difference so we don't have to pay copyrights. In much the same way as that uh, Tom Waits sued a railway company or an advert company for using his song, Downtown Train, and using a Tom Waits impersonator to sound like Tom Waits when Tom Waits said, you guys can't pay me enough money in the world to use Downtown Train for an advert. And they went, great, we'll get a Tom Waits impersonator to do it. And he sued them and he won, by the way. Um, copyright is fair of, in one respect. And uh, I've mentioned it before. There's a concept of uh, a moron in a hurry. If it looks like something, it could fool somebody who's in a hurry. Then it stands a reasonable chance of breaching your copyright laws. So um, hence cover version albums as a cover album of Depeche Mode called For the Masses. Now, for some reason features shots of uh, loudspeakers painted nearly red in unusual places, uh, which looks very similar to this cover indeed. So the blind mix on this has been remixed by Daniel Miller, the band's, uh, the manager of the band's label, occasional producer uh, and the normal himself. Um, and the blind mix is a complete reconstruction of the track. So it has a different rhythm, it has a different uh, kind of, it's got the same bass line, but it's only got half the bass lines in it. It's got a completely different drum pattern, different arrangements. And the band liked the remix, the blind mix, so much that in fact they remixed the blind mix, created an edit version of it, and used that as the LP mix of the track. So if you listen to the LP mix or the 7 inch mix, you're acting to two very, very different recordings. The LP mix of Strange Love is a remix of Daniel Miller's remix and the 7 inch version is actually the Depeche Mode mix of the track but Depeche Mode don't necessarily like the, the 7 inch mix of Strange Love. Um, Alan thinks it's very cluttered as a mix, he's absolutely right, There's, it's got more hooks than um, a, like a shark's mouth. It is really a very cluttered mix indeed. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I love Strange Love, but it, it's difficult to find out which version of the track that I do like. Uh, in America, here is the CD single that was released, I think, after the fact. Uh, I think this might be a 1992 version of it. Yes, it's got Violator on the inside um, and it contains all the tracks off the 7 inches and the 12 inches as well. Um, there's also an alternate version of the Pain Mix, which features samples from Cameo's Word Up. Uh, but once you've heard it, you really, really wish that you hadn't. I think Strange Love is a very, very underrated Depeche Mode single. Um, uh, it's, it's, although it's not an organic song, it feels like it's a construction. It's like the band have taken lots of different parts and they put them together. It doesn't quite hang as a song. You know, some of their progressions don't necessarily feel like the song is is really flowing in a natural and organic fashion it kind of feels like well we've got this bit here and that bit there and if we put those two bits together and we've got the third bit and, and then you end up with some kind of almost frankenstein of the song song arrangement is is something completely fascinating and i could talk about it for years and i probably won't if that is okay um second single from the album uh which was released not long after again uh never let me down again this track is putting it technically a banger. Uh, played live at near enough every Depeche Mode live show, every solo show, if there are solo shows. Here is the uh, fantastic or fantastic orange vinyl German version of it um, in late 1987 in order to, to kind of capitulate on the extra interest that had been generated by the band and their success, Intercord in Germany released coloured vinyl versions of many of their albums and many of their singles. Um, and in fact, Mute Records found that the sales of the Music for the Masses album had suffered as a result because people were buying the import versions. And so they released their own clear vinyl version of Music for the Masses uh, several weeks after the release of the original black vinyl version. Uh, which is now staggeringly expensive on Discogs, and that is why I don't have it. 
uh, because I, my buying decisions at the time were all geared around how much money is it. So this version of Never Let Me Down Again, for example, the orange vinyl version, costs the same as a regular black one. Um, this was, again, has a deletion hole cut into it. So again, it cost me about £3 as opposed to uh, about £3.49. Uh, this Never Let Me Down Again is a Depeche Mode classic, although it wasn't a great selling single. You know, I think it got to maybe 22 or something like that. Um, and also at the same point, uh, this was an album that, that caused the purists to weep tears of rage uh, because Martin was playing guitar on stage during the TV appearances. He plays a guitar on the song. It was the first time that Depeche Mode had started to visibly use guitars in their sound. Um, and it's also, by the way, a fantastically constructed song. Um, it's built upon a sample of Led Zeppelin's When the Levy Breaks, the drum sound off that, that you've heard on dozens and dozens of tracks. Uh, it's got a kind of Zeppelin-esque feel, that epic kind of cashmere approach to, to kind of like an endlessly undulating song that just rises and rises and rises. It never quite reaches a conclusion, uh, but, but feels like it's constantly upping the tension. And the main chord section that we've got on there that's become a you know, trademark part of the band's sound for this song is actually a stretch sample of uh, a recording of Carmen Baruna um, with a huge choir in it. So it's a really strange song. On paper, nothing about this song works. It just doesn't, because it's got a very flat, very thin vocal melody that only really goes between two notes. And yet somehow, less is more in that respect. So when David does sing outside of that register, the song feels bigger and better, because it's holding back a little bit of gas in the tank until the end. Um, it's a brilliant song. If you've ever seen Depeche Live, you'll know this is the song that they close the main set or the encore set with. And it's a song where everybody waves their arms like some kind of huge mass field of wheat made of 20,000 miserable 40-somethings. Um, and it's got the same kind of effect as when I see U2 and they play Where the Streets Have No Name. There's a moment where, and I, always, I do this when I see Depeche when they play this song, and I do it when I see U2 play Where the Streets Have No Name. It, I look at the crowd because the crowd is more interesting than the band at that point. You've got that look on everybody's faces that goes, this is the moment. This is what I came here for. This is what I want to experience. And it's, it's beautiful and wonderful, you know, to stand in a, a room or a field um, with the band that you love, the people that have made music that have changed who you are and how they work and or how I see the world and have made my life brighter when it's been quite dark and to go, yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm watching the people that made the record, that made my life better. Um, it's a wonderful experience. It's the same thing when the U2, U2 play streets. It's just there's that thing on people's faces where you go, that's it. That's what you want, isn't it? That's the moment you've come for. Um, and of course, it's pretty good. So there's the... That's a standard 12-inch version of Never Let Me Down Again. It's black, backed with a split mix, which is an extended 12-inch version. Uh, there's a glitter mix of a track called Pleasure Little Treasure, which is their um, the B-side. And then there's an aggro mix of Never Let Me Down Again. I've created a compendium of all the mixes together to create like a 15-minute version of Never Let Me Down Again. Um, and the B-side, Pleasure Little Treasure, uh, highly rated by many fans, played live on the music for the Masses tour. But Pleasure Little, Little Treasure is also the song that um, Alan Wilder regards as one of the three worst ones that he did in Depeche Mode. He's embarrassed by this, and, uh, well, sorry, he's embarrassed by that. Pleasure Little Treasure, he's embarrassed by it. It's Called a Heart, uh, and there's another song that's name of which I've temporarily forgotten because I looked it up a while ago, and there's only so much I can carry in my brain. Uh, but there, that's the 7-inch of Pleasure Little Treasure, including, by the way, my favourite 7-inch adapter. Uh, that's my favourite uh, design for a 7-inch adapter there. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, the cover of this, by the way, um, some people think that there's some kind of symbolism around the map. There isn't. It's just a random page from a map. And the, these photographs here that are on the cover are not taken at those locations. These photographs are taken... Uh, all across the UK. I think that's a, a power station near Nottingham, which has now, I think, probably been demolished because most power stations have been demolished. If you look on the back, uh, these are uh, shots taken from, I think, the Pennines uh, and woodland in the UK. And, and, you know, England's got a lot of green in it. When people tell you that England's full, they're fibbing because England um, has got 
we might have, or the UK might have 60 million, 70 million people in it. And it's the same size as Oklahoma, but there's plenty of space around here as uh, the, these, these kind of a test. This is the Remix 12 inch of Never Let Me Down Again. Uh, this version, again, is the German Intercord version. And I have something very, very nice to show you here. Uh, this is your splatter vinyl 12 inch. Um, these days they would charge you an extra few quid and it would probably be 30 pounds for that uh, you literally couldn't give them away in the late 80s because uh, my version again was imported with a deletion cut through it because nobody was buying it but if you look at that um, oh look at that look at my lovely vinyl anyway um, it's gorgeous I haven't got anything quite like it it just looks fantastic I'm, I'm so it's so bizarre can you imagine if you were the guy that worked in pressing records and then thought, well, actually, if we if we put different colour things in there, you can create coloured vinyls, you can create splatter vinyls. Uh, and it's like, whoa, dude, you've just invented a whole new niche. Of course, collecting all the different shades of coloured vinyl is very much society's way of telling you um, that you've got too much money to spend on records. Um, so, never let me down again. Absolute classic. Pleasure, little treasure. Not so much a classic, although the 12 inch of it uh, can, is, is a thing called the Glitter Mix. I think one of the reasons people don't necessarily like playing a little treasure is because the band hadn't worked out an ending for it. So if you listen to one of the remixes of it, and I think it is the, the, the Glitter Mix, um, what they've actually done is, is they've kind of fudged an ending because what they did is they took vocal samples from the ending of the Everything Counts reprise on the Construction Time Again album, fed it into a sampler, chopped it up, reversed it, and then played it as a series of vocal samples, of whoop, whoop, yeep, whoop, and stuck it through a whole bunch of preset filters uh, on, on a particular pedal, um, so that it sounds far more exciting than it actually is. The ending of it is quite literally a guy just pressing next one, next one, next one on the effects. Uh, it's perhaps not quite as exciting as you might think, but the ending of Pleasure to Treasure it sounds like the song stopped and they hadn't worked out how to reach a conclusion for it but it is a great song uh, second track on the 12 inch by the way uh, the third track on the second side of the 12 which is a track called the spanish taster of to have and to hold uh, which is you know if you want to see the difference between martin and alan's approach um, martin's version of to have and to hold is very very similar to the spanish taster effectively the spanish taster mix which is a faster bouncier more major chordy happier version of to have and to hold uh, was very much designed to replicate martin's demo on more expensive equipment whereas the album version of to have and to hold is, is alan's arrangement of the track of course it don't count for anything if we don't get to the record itself and i've spent half of this video just talking about the first two singles and for some reason movies from 1982 um, we have the sixth album music for the masses um, and i think this is where the band really took a great leap this is the first album where i think um, depeche really mastered the art of making a record although i think the sequencing of the album is not amazing um, so the the running order has never let me down again that one we know the things we said which is a martin vocal um, the remix of the daniel miller mix of strange love sacred little 15 side two is behind the wheel i want you now to have to hold nothing and pimp and i think that the sequence of the album is really poor because I think Never Let Me Down Again is a climatic track. It should be the last song on side two, and there should be an extended kind of split mix of the track, which runs to nine minutes, which really kind of almost fades into nothing. This gives you the feeling of this sense of grand conclusion uh, around that. I think the, the album really, if you played side two and then side one, it might be a better record, actually. So I think the, the running order for the album should be Pimp first, then Behind the Wheel, then uh, the hijack version of Strange Love, which I'll mention in a moment, Sacred, uh, The Things You Said, and then Little 15, which which takes it, by the way, to 28 minutes. And then flip it over on side two, which I have nothing, Pleasure, Little Treasure, I Want You Now, To Have and To Hold, and then the Torn Witch version of Never Let Me Down Again, which would run 25 minutes, which gives you a 53-minute LP. Uh, but given that um, they could do 34 minutes onto a vinyl disc in the in the mid 90s thanks to the, the the wonders of great cutting engineers you could easily fit this onto two sides of a record um music for the masses has beautiful cover art by the way 
Um, and I want to talk about the cover art because the cover art here, what you can see is you've got these three speakers uh, broadcasting to the masses, uh, or to quote the, um, the, the, the quote right at the bottom, spreading the news around the world. Um, and then if you look at the inner sleeve, again, you've got these shots of these speakers in unusual places, places they don't belong, really broadcasting it out. So tying in with the concept of the album being called Music for the Masses is that we've got these speakers everywhere. It's almost inescapable, like propaganda. Um, and it's it kind of ties in with Big Brother. There's iconography around that. Um, but also there's, there's like the concept of, well, if it's music for the masses, it's very similar, as I've mentioned previously, to Orwell's uh, Versimilicator, I think it's called, or Versicator, the, um, the machine that writes music um, that you can't escape, that's pumped out of speakers everywhere you are in public. And if you've ever been to a shopping mall recently, uh, you'll know that they really do play music all the time at you, whether you like it or not, which is why I always wear headphones uh, when I leave the house. Um, the theme around objects in strange places obviously ties in with the themes that we've got for uh, Black, Black Celebration, which again is a skyscraper covered in military flags and drapes, some great reward, which is a married couple in the middle of an industrial estate, um, construction time again, which is a worker with a huge great big hammer right at the top of a mountain range and a broken frame, which is a woman with a scythe in the middle of a field. Um, the speaking spell obviously also features objects that don't belong together because it's a swan covered in a plastic bag, which is a stupid cover and it's awful. Um, Music for the Masses is a fantastic album and I want to talk about the songs that go on it, uh, but I also have to show you uh, an unusual release. This is the HMV 12 inch. So if you bought Music for the Masses in the first few days and you bought it from a HMV store in the UK, there was a, a free 12 inch single which featured uh, the maxi mix of Strange Love and the aggro mix of Never Let Me Down Again. Although by the look of it, it actually contains more than just the aggro mix because there's actually two tracks on the vinyl. I should have listened to this, uh, but this, this, this vinyl itself sells for something like £100 on Discord. So I'm certainly probably not going to be playing it just to indulge my curiosity. Uh, but there it is, the HMV only 12 inch of music for the masses, uh, which adds two extra tracks to the album. Um, and the CD edition of music for the masses, by the way, uh, did feature CD bonus tracks because CDs were uh, expensive and new and exciting. And so therefore you put bonus tracks that weren't on the CD singles, if there were CD singles. So the CD version of music for the masses uh, features Agent Orange, the aggro mix uh, of Never Let Me Down, Tavern to Hold, Spanish Taster, and the glitter mix of Pleasure, Mr. Treasure. Uh, but of course, there were also proper CD releases of Never Let Me Down Again. So here's a German CD single, uh, which features the same tracks on there. And here's the American CD single, After the Fact, which contains all the tracks off the two 12 inches and the seven inch. I've also got a promotional postcard for Music for the Masses, with the tour dates, if you wanted to see them at Whitley Bay Ice Rink, which is probably a child's soft play centre now, City Hall in Sheffield, St George's Hall in Bradford, uh, and the Brighton Centre. This was definitely going to be the last tour that the band played, which wasn't in great big whacking mega arenas. Um, they were on the cusp of greatness. And the title for the album, Music for the Masses, was inspired by a compilation series of, um, of LPs called Music for the Millions. And also, by the way, a 1941 musical film called Music for Millions, um, which, which tread the same ground. And Martin was uh, looking in a record shop, saw the album called Music for the Millions, and thought, nice title, I'll have it. And there we are. And so therefore you have music for the masses and the iconography of the speaker broadcasting out inescapably across the landscape is something which ties in with the title that we've got for it. Um, I think the album is, is, is absolutely great. As I said, I don't think the sequencing is particularly good, but the album itself is, is absolutely fantastic. And what we've got with music for the masses is we've got a far more mature uh, approach to to the lyric writing. So the lyric writing that we've got on uh, A Broken Frame, for example, The Meaning of Love, I've written more than a th or read more than a thousand books and seen more than a hundred films or whatever, whatever the lyric is. Those are abstract lyrics about not knowing what relationships are. Music for the Masses is an album that's, that's not abstract. It's far more real. It deals with concepts like infidelity, betrayal, uh, jealousy, 
uh, you know, lust and faith and all those type of concepts, things which Martin Gore had kind of started to write about in other albums, but here it became really obvious he wasn't just writing about things that he'd read about in books, he was writing about real things that he was very, very, very much experiencing. And in uh, on, the, on the album as well, by the way, and, and this is where I probably shouldn't have put it down, but I should be uh, demonstrating it to you, is that there are uh, lots of things in the lyrics which are, which really show a, you know a great maturity in the writing. So the things you said, uh, regarded by some fans as as a good song, I, I think it's a really good Depeche Mode song. I think it suffers from its placement on the album because there's no way that you can follow Never Let Me Down Again. Uh, and after Never Let Me Down Again, you've got another nine songs on the LP to go. So it's all downhill from there, quite literally. Uh, the lyric to the things you said is, is very, very minimal. When you look at the lyric to the things you said, lines one to four and uh, lines seven to eight in every verse uh, are repeated. There's only two lines that differ in each of the verses, and those are lines five and six. So, you know, um, never felt so disappointed. I thought you knew you better than that. All that type of thing. They're all repetitions. It got to the point where it's actually just writing a really slow Ramon song. If you're playing your Ramon 78s at 33, that's probably what the things you said is like. And that's no way a criticism, by the way. Because if you played the things you said at 78, which I haven't done, it would probably only be about a minute and a half long. I might try that later just to keep myself amused. Now, um, the fourth track, which I haven't really discussed, is Sacred. And Sacred is, is one of the songs that touches upon religion. It picks up the themes that were dropped in Blasphemous Rumours and then later carried on later in, in Songs of Faith and Devotion. Um, it's the first mention of The Devout, which is, by the way, the name of a Depeche Mode tribute band, but also about, um, effectively, devotees, which is what the band's, band's fans used to call themselves and what the band's crew used to have on their crew shirts, devotee. Um, the lyric in, in Sacred is, is very clearly about um, religion and spreading the news around the world, almost like a missionary, uh, which is traveling around the world preaching the gospel. And there's an analogy between that and the band themselves going on tour and preaching the news to the converted by playing concerts. Uh, they didn't, you know, at this point the band was so big that they weren't playing shows to people that didn't know who they were. They were playing shows to people that not only knew who they were, but probably knew more about the band than the band themselves did, which is a quite a frightening place to be. There is a, um, I think there's a thing on, on YouTube where sometimes people ask stars or celebrities questions from their Wikipedia page to let find out how much they know about themselves versus a super fan. Normally the super fan gets it right um so uh, that's that's another thing sacred by the way I, i'm veering off track sacred has an alternate mix that currently only exists in a cassette form um that's circulating on the internet with a completely different set of synth lines and hook lines in it which are absolutely great but again like strange love a very busy very cluttered mix and i think the version that they used for the lp was probably about the right level of complexity because it was complex without being like a jigsaw of sound where you were trying to work out what the main melody actually was. Um, side one ends with the fourth single off the album, only released uh, internationally, not released in the UK, but it sold so many copies it charted, just like the Jams That's Entertainment, Little 15, that got its own uh, catalogue number, Little 15, so it wouldn't mess up with the symmetry of the bong numbers. I might not have explained that. All Depeche Mode singles had the suffix bong on from around 1982 onwards. There is no particular reason that the band have ever confessed to as to what that is. I suspect it's not so much to do with drugs, just to do with the name bong. Sounds particularly good. Side 2 opens with Behind the Wheel. And Behind the Wheel was released as a single on the 28th of December 1987. Here is a 7-inch. Here is a 12-inch. Here's, oh, that's a surprise, another 12-inch, uh, another limited edition 12-inch. Here is uh, a CD single of Behind the Wheel from America. Again, released out of time with all the tracks from the 7-inch and the 12-inch that's on it. Behind the Wheel is a Depeche Mode classic. Uh, it, the single is backed with a cover version of, I think, Bobby Troop's Route 66, sung by Martin and recorded quickly uh, in a couple of days. And um, with the, the track Behind the Wheel, uh, it's a very, very repetitive, very minimal song, and it's designed to create almost this this sense of like when you're driving and you're on a really long trip, 
and it feels like you're never going to get there. And there's somebody in the back. So I was asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Behind the Wind is designed to be a very minimal, repetitive song that kind of echoes the sense of endless travel, Europe endless, where the road itself will carry on forever. The autobahn will stretch into the future. And uh, you know, to paraphrase George Orwell again, if you want to imagine the human future, imagine uh, a car driving on a motorway forever. Much like, I think, that Manic Minor, the end screen of Manic Minor, which sees a man being crushed by a boot, is probably the closest and most accurate video game adaptation of 1984, the human face being crushed by a boot forever. Um, Behind the Wheel is a fantastic song. It's not my favourite song, because I think I've seen them play it pretty much every time I've seen Depeche Mode. They play Behind the Wheel, but it is a classic. I think that the remix of Behind the Wheel, here's a, here's, a, here's a 12-inch, which has remix by Shep Pettibone, and the 12-inch mix of Route 66, remix by the Beat Masters. Shep Pettibone mix, I think, is, is quite vulgar. If that's a word, it's very simplistic. It reduces the layering, it reduces the bass lines. It makes the song very much a start, straight line, stop, end, finished, kaput, with no drama in the song. Whereas the LP mix, I think, is far more astute uh, around managing to layer the songs in an order and to present them together in a way that builds drama, but also at the same point, like a Mobius strip of sound. The song starts where it ends and there's no real conclusion to it because the road becomes my bride and it goes on forever. Um, so Route 66, uh, I'm going to mention later, but Behind the Wheel, Depeche Mode Classic. So there's a 12 inch of it. There's another 12 inch. This is the uh, the Beatmasters mix of Behind the Wheel, limited edition 12 inch. Uh, this naturally was pressed on coloured vinyl in some countries. My one comes in the best of all colours, black. Uh, but there it, there it is, and uh, the B side of it, the casualty mix of Route 66, isn't particularly good. But again, what you're looking at here is there's an iconography around this. That's not really selling the bands in a huge way. There's no cheesy pictures of them smiling on the front. This is like holding a piece of mass-produced art and big secrets. In Japan, I Want You Now was released as a single instead, as a three-inch CD that now sells for something like £100. I don't have that, and I'm never going to change that position unless I become a multi-bazillionaire. All offers are accepted uh, in that count. So the LP, Music for the Masses, I've kind of veered a little bit away from the LP. Here we go again, back to the start. Um, the next track on there is I Want You Now. And I Want You Now is... A strange and unusual song. Now the second half, the second side of Music for the Masses, is quite difficult. It's not full of pop tracks, to put it bluntly at all. I Want You Now is a song that I think in the studio recorded version doesn't really fulfil its potential. There was a rearrangement of I Want You Now that was played on the 1994 tour that I think is much, much better. That's my go-to version of the track. And there's the Have and Hold as well. Now, the last new track on the album is Nothing. Um, and, and Nothing is a really interesting song because what, what we have with Nothing is what you really get to see with Nothing is the influence of, of Iggy Pop and the Stooges on Depeche Mode. Martin Gore is playing, basically, his version of a Stooges song in Nothing. It's a very nihilist, very one-dimensional song. Uh, it's got a very limited lyric. It reminds me very much of songs like uh, Bored by, uh, by Iggy Pop and things like that. I'm the chairman of the board. Those type of songs where there's, there's quite a nihilist worldview that sits alongside it. And you can easily imagine nothing being played by the Stooges, actually. Uh, and when it came to 2004 and the remixes album, there was a remix of nothing, which was called the Head Cleaner Rock Mix. And that's exactly what it is. It's a rock band playing a rock arrangement of Nothing with Dave Gowan's vocals um, over the top. Uh, and then we've got the album ends on Pimp, which I think is a bad place to end the album because that should that was the intro tape for the tour. To me, Pimp belongs at the beginning and not at the end. Um, as I've mentioned before, there was Behind the Wheel as a single. Um, I've mentioned the American CD single of Behind the Wheel. Um, Behind the Wheel was also quite popular from a mashup perspective. Here is a a white label, sort of white label, 12 inch of uh, uh, Just Behind the Wheel, which is kind of um, a, a mashup of Behind the Wheel and Dub Be Good to Me, which is better than it sounds and worse than you fear at the same time. In the outside of the UK, in France only, 
as I've said, Little 15 was released as a single and it charted here as the Little 15 uh, 7 inch. Again, it's got a hole, and again, it's got the best 7 inch adapter of all time in there. Uh, this has no barcodes on it, um, but the 12 inch does, and this also has the catalogue number of Little 15 so that it wouldn't mess with the bong sequence. Um, that the band were using for their singles. It is backed with two tracks. One is, uh, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, so apologies to, to uh, all of my friends that speak other languages. I think it's Sajana, which effectively translates as star, I think in Swedish, but it could be Finnish. Um, and then the third track on the 12 inch is a cover version of Sonata 14, Moonlight Sonata it's called, uh, performed by Alan Wilder although it's released on a Depeche Mode record with uh, Depeche Mode on the label there. So even though you might be thinking, oh, it's an Alan Wilder solo track, it's like, no, really, it's on a Depeche Mode record. It's just pointing out that it's performed by Alan Wilder. I don't understand why Moonlight Sonata is on this release. The band had clearly run out of B-sides. Uh, there is nothing, there is there is no Depeche-ness whatsoever in the cover version of Moonlight Sonata. It's a very basic lovely and relaxing very faithful very very well played piano cover version of the track um but it charted in the uk an import alone uh, and the, the video is absolutely terrible uh, little 15 was the last song to be recorded for the album uh, heavily influenced by michael nyman alan had been to see a screening i think of peter greenaway's z and two noughts and i think the soundtrack to that was by michael nyman and he listened to it and then thought i can copy the michael nyman style as I mentioned earlier in the previous one, there's lots of arpeggios in songs like Sometimes, which were inspired by Philip Glass as well. And it's clear we'll do that. And then suddenly Little 15 kind of all locked together and happened very, very quickly. Um, and then the band played. Uh, the, that was the last single that was released from the album, unless you were in America, at which point the last single was actually a 1988 remix of Strange Love, here with an alternate picture from it this wasn't this wasn't released on cd apart from promo cd it was only released on a sire records 12 inch for seven inch it was uh, had the hijack remix which was by uh tim simonian and mark saunders uh tim simonian of bomb the bass who later produced the ultra album and then on the b side we had two absolutely awful remixes of nothing the zip hop mix and the dub mix by uh i think justin strauss uh, for Just Right Productions. Those are terrible remixes, and I'll be very happy to never, ever hear them again. However, the Hijack remix of Strange Love is in my top three Depeche Mode tracks of all time. And not only my top three Depeche Mode tracks, my top three Depeche Mode mixes. It is the definitive version of Strange Love with a fantastic, glorious, extended introduction that should open an LP. Uh, the Hijack remix is the version that should have been on the album. It's it's just amazing. I listened to it on first listened to it on the B side of the Everything Counts reissue. And I'm like, if this is a remix they're putting on a B side, they must be good. Of course, I didn't realise that was going to be in my top three Depeche Mode tracks of all time. So they hoodwinked me into spending thousands of pounds and gazillions of hours travelling all over the world to go and see Depeche Mode. But I regret nothing apart from the fact that I didn't have more money and more time to be able to go to more shows. Uh, genuinely I don't, I really wish I'd seen a lot of tours that I didn't see, I didn't see the uh, devotional tour, which I will talk about to my eternal regret at a later point in time, um, but the Hijack remix of Strange Love is fantastic, I will post a link to it down there, it's a definitive version of one of Depeche Mode's very 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 best tracks, and that brings the music for the masses era to a close, I am aware of the existence of a film called 101 I will get to that the next time I talk about Depeche Mode. I'm also aware of the existence of uh, the first Depeche Mode solo album, Hydrology, because well, uh, one and two is an EP, by Recoil. Recoil being the instrumental branch of Alan Wilder and his own songwriting. But I will talk about those in the next episode. Uh, the next episode is where I'm going to be talking about a fistful of things, including one of the best live albums of all time, 101. Uh, the very first solo release by Martin Gore, Counterfeit, which, by the way, has just been available for the reorder on vinyl from Mute Records. And, uh, of course, the film 101. Uh, what I haven't mentioned, there are two major Depeche Mode releases I haven't got. 
and both of them come from this period. What I haven't mentioned is the fan club flexi disc of Never Turn Your Back on Mother Earth, uh, released it and sent to fan club members in Christmas 1987. Um, the reason I haven't mentioned it is because there's a Martin Gore version of Never Turn Your Back on Mother Earth on the Counterfeit EP, so I kind of have it because the version on the 7 inch flexi disc of Never Turn Your Back on Mother Earth is just performed by Martin anyway. And of course, the I Want You Now 3 inch CD single because I'm not made of money. Um, in conclusion, Music for the Masses is a really bloody good album. It's let down by one thing and one thing only, the sequencing. And I will post it in the comments, my preferred sequencing for the album. It's taken me about 30 years to find a sequence that I like for it. Um, I am a real stickler for sequencing in albums. I do have a not cast way back there where I talk about how sequencing is important to an album and ebb and flow. And I'll probably link to it down there, but it was in my early days of not casting. Uh, I'm not saying I'm good now, but I was definitely more bad stroke less good at that point. Um, so I'm going to wrap up here. Thank you for spending 45 minutes listening to me talk about Depeche Mode. I will uh, wrap up here, put loads of stuff in the comments. I will see you all soon. Stay beautiful and take care of yourselves. Okay. Uh, see you later. Boys and girls, thank you, and as Dave Garn says, good night. <laughs>